we're back with another episode of the Room for Nuance podcast. My name is Sean DeMars. Your name is? Jeremy Rennie. Jeremy, will you open us up in prayer? I would love to. Okay. Heavenly Father, we love you so much because you've chosen us for the foundation of the world. Thank you for sending your son to die for us, to rise again. We thank you for sending the Holy Spirit to give us the new birth and to give us faith. And so, Lord, we just recognize we're all in your hands, that our salvation is from you and through you and to you. And, Lord, um, we just thank you for your church. I thank you for Christians and churches and elders and pastors serving all over the world. And that, God, you're getting your great kingdom work done through this ragtag band of um, redeemed sinners. Thanks, Lord, for this conversation. Thanks for Sean's ministry. And pray that you would uh, cause the words we speak to each other to be helpful to anyone who listens. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. You've been called the Jimmy Buffett of the Nine Marks world. (laughs) I did not know that. (laughs) Hey, something interesting from your prayer just now. Yeah. You said this ragtag. Yeah. uh, What'd you say, ragtag? Yeah. Something. Yeah. Yeah. We get like a ragtag team. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I feel that more than ever. Uh I've been feeling that more than ever lately. Uh Jesus brings up brings a whole bunch of screw ups together and uses us. Yeah. Is that something that you just kind of threw out there subconsciously or like, have you been meditating on that? Um, I, yeah. It, so I, I did just throw it out there as I was thinking, but I think it's just my experience of okay. 27 years of ministry is yeah. I'm always working with a ragtag bunch of people Yeah, and I'm like chief ragtag among them. Yeah. yeah. No, I see the shirt you're wearing. Yeah. You don't have yeah. to explain yourself. <laughs> so the title of this episode is going probably going to be like the eldering episode. Okay. But before we get into that, yeah. can you tell us uh, your testimony, how you came to know the Lord? Sure. Um, my uh, mother uh, brought us to church. and, uh, and Not I, father. Not father. He came to Christ a little later. But my mom was wanting to get us into a church, uh, so she took us to this little Baptist church. I grew up in Las Vegas, Nevada, just outside, and uh, little uh, little Baptist church in our town. And so they preached the gospel, and I heard the gospel in vacation Bible school and youth group. And they didn't altar call every Sunday, and uh, and it was just one of those things where, as the pastor preached, as he shared the gospel every Sunday, preached expositionally, I just started to feel that conviction and that. That sense of uh, what I would call it is summons. I felt like the Lord was summoning me to follow him. And um, and so I just repented and believed. And it was kind of not remarkable. Uh, I think I later went down for an altar call, but I think I was already saved at that point. Um, but um, yeah, and and so I just grew up in a church where it's just kind of meat and potatoes, teaching the Bible. I grew up under expositional preaching in my faith. So I just assumed that was what you did. Uh, so when, when I eventually became a pastor, that's all I really knew. Um, and uh, and so I grew up in that church, was discipled in that church. And then from there, I went to Wheaton College um, for my undergraduate. Okay. And then... Wait, yeah. okay, 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 go ahead. Yeah, then Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary for my grad school. And what, what years was that? That was, uh, I graduated from Wheaton in 93 and Gordon-Conwell in 96. So you had David Wells. I had David Wells. Roger Nicole. Yeah, uh, I missed Roger Nicole. Okay. I had Greg Beal. Okay, nice. For a lot, which was great. Yeah. Haddon Robinson, wonderful homiletics teacher. Okay. Um, yeah. All right, and then, so walk Meredith us. Meredith Klein for Ooh, biblical theology. Yeah. I didn't even know what I was sitting under. Yeah. And then later I was like, wait, I was like with the Yoda of the biblical theology yeah. world. Yeah. You were like biblical theology, right, guys? Yeah, like we all get this right, and I didn't realize. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. But walk us from you get saved to the path, like the path to becoming a pastor. Yeah. Did Did your youth pastor say like, "Oh, you've got the call"? <laughs> <laughs> like, what? How did you get there? I uh, I just had a great because like you should be making yeah. margaritas somewhere, <laughs> you know. So <laughs> yeah, I. Uh, um, yeah, no comment. Yeah. I uh, yeah, so I uh, in high school was just uh, excited about the Word of God. Is excited about ministry, teaching in vacation Bible school, teaching. Um, y- you know, going on short term mission trips. Well, um, I really wanted to do more with missions. So between my junior and senior year of high school, I spent uh, two months in <laughs> Taiwan doing a short term mission. Basically, we did these. Uh, teach English as second language classes, not like any formal train sense, yeah. just more like, hey, here's Americans. 
hang out with them and talk English, but we do it in the church. Then we build relationships and share the gospel. Uh, but after the end of that, I just had a, a, a sense of a desire to give my life to serve the Lord in whatever that meant. So we were doing a debrief at the end of uh, our mission trip. All these different teams came back and reassembled. Uh, and, and I was sitting by a lake one night under the stars. And I was just like, Lord, like, you know, I enlist. I'm, I'm in. I'm like, I don't know what that means. I don't know if I'm going to go to mission field. I don't know if I'm going to be a pastor. I don't know what that means, but like take my life. I want to serve you. And so that was kind of the crossing the Rubicon for me. And then from there, getting into the pastoral ministry is more like a dimmer switch, slowly turning on over a multiple year period. Yeah. Well, when did you, when did the light officially become on? Like really, like when was the room well lit? I think it was, um, it was when I finally got to seminary and then started getting involved in a local church okay. in Massachusetts, uh, which ended up being the church I became the senior pastor of. Okay. But at that time, I was just an, an intern. And, was that uh, the one Mark planted? Uh, no, that was, um, yeah, this one was from like the okay. 1940 or something. Okay. So then, uh, yeah, so I, uh, I, I just started getting involved in pastoral ministry and then and finally, I, I got a, my first job there as an assistant. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of when it started clicking, like, oh, I like this. I, okay. You know, this is it. It's, pa it's pastoral work. So it wasn't like you saw the, the pastor and thought, oh, I want to do that. Yeah. It was almost like there was a need. You were happy to meet it. And then as you were doing yeah. that, you yeah. were like, oh, this is actually great. Yeah. And, and kind of like the Lord <laughs> was, I think I just had a broader uh, field of view of what I could do. But the Lord kept just kind of closing oh. it. And it was like, you know, mission field, no, just certain things happened. Things we pursued kept getting blocked. And then other things started getting blocked until finally I was in pastoral ministry. And I was like, yes, you know, this is where I'm going. And it just kind of like one thing led to another. Yeah. yeah. Did you ever think about going into like academia or anything like that? Um, once I became a senior pastor, there was a period where I started toying with, should I go back and get a, a PhD in yeah. maybe church history or something? And I remember I was just praying about it one day, walking and um, and asking the Lord, like, Lord, what you know, what do you want me to do? And and I love studying uh, the Great Awakening. I love studying these pr these periods where there's great preaching and people are coming to faith. And and I, I just had this sense of like, you know, you could study that, or you could just do it. You could be the a preacher, not you know that. I'm George Whitfield or somebody, but just like I could preach yeah. the word. Why not? Why not actually just do it yeah. and let someone else study the history of it? Yeah. yeah. And then you said, I'm the best pastor <laughs> <laughs> and I know all the things. Best ragtag pastor. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and so what I'm going to do is take it upon myself to write the manual <laughs> for eldering. And you did it. Wow. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It, Almost like that, just a little okay. different. Yeah. All right, tell us your version of yeah, okay. it. Okay, my version. I mean, that's the version that <laughs> I'm going to tell, but you tell your version. Fair enough. Okay. Yeah. My version was um, talking to Jonathan Lehman. H how did you guys know each other? We knew each other through Nine Marks. So how I, did you know about Nine Marks? I was going, okay, so I'd been in the church seven years, pastoring the church. The number of completion? It is the number of completion. Yeah. It's also the number of sabbatical. <sighs> so, and the church was growing. I was very pragmatic in my approach to the local church, but I was doing exposition. And I was wrestling with, yeah. So like every Acts 29 church. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Kind of. Okay, go ahead. So I was, uh, I, yeah, so I was preaching the word consecutively at exposition. And, but I was just kind of like, well, hey, let's try that. Saddleback. Okay, let's try that. And let's try this. And, oh, I heard about that kind of thing, approach to philosophy ministry. And, and I was wrestling with it. And the church was was growing numerically. And it was getting that sense of like momentum and energy. So then uh, it was seven years in. And, and I was like, I told the elders, I was like, I'd like a sabbatical. I said, I want to figure out the model for our church. Mm -hmm. And that was the language. That was the category I had. I'm like, I want the model. So this was my sabbatical, dude. I went all summer to different churches every week mm -hmm. to check out the model. Uh, and I went like all over the country. I went and visited any friends I had and I checked out different churches. Wait, before yeah. you go on, yeah. tell us the worst one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what was the worst one? 
Saddleback freaked me out pretty Okay. Good. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was, I don't know if it's the worst, but I definitely had like a strong reaction. I've heard the children's ministry there has like a Noah's Ark thing where- Which is rad. It floods. No, it's rad. Yeah. It refills. Really? Yeah, like it's like every 15 minutes there's, I mean, they don't have like the people dying. I was going to say like, the, are they like yeah. drowning people? Not, no dead like, bodies. Everyone's it's, in yeah. the Ark. Okay, okay, <laughs> that's, that's right. cool. Only okay, eight, so anyways, only, yeah, you yeah. went around, you visited- and eventually, what you made it? You tried CHBC. So, so here's what happened. Okay. I was planning this uh, this nomadic, pragmatic thing, and um, and I I got my Gordon Conwell alumni magazine. Uh, there's this article in there by Michael Lawrence, who I'd gone to seminary with at Gordon Conwell, okay. and he was at CHBC, Capitol Hill Baptist. So, uh, and he had he had an article in there about a sermon application grid, and I was like, oh, that's cool. I like that. Yeah. And then at the bottom, it's like, he's with Nine Marks Ministries. And I was like, what's that? And so the internet had like just been invented. So <laughs> I, I went on and I Googled or whatever it was back then, Nine yeah. Marks. And I found the website. You put in the CD for yes. AOL. I put it, in the AOL uh, CD. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Googled it. Okay. Yeah, that's right. And You and probably used Yahoo Search, to I be honest. I probably did. Okay, it's yeah. probably Yahoo Search. That yeah. And I just looked and I, I started clicking through the website and all the Nine Marks. And I was like... Wait, this is the mod the model that I keep seeing in the Bible. And I was like, wait, you can actually just uh, How old are you at this point? Uh I would be 34. Okay. And um and so I I so I clicked I saw a weekender so I clicked on it. And I and so the beginning of my this journey I went on started with the CHBC weekender and I went to it and it was, you know, it's like I was born again. And then when I found reformed theology, I was born again, again. And when I found biblical theology, I was born again, again, again. And then this was born again, again, again. I was just like, this is look, they're actually just doing, trying to follow the Bible for church. And then I spent the rest of the summer going to all these other churches going, no, <laughs> no. But now I knew why. Because I was like, wait, this isn't, you know, so it was like the whole thing came together like a thunderclap. It was the first time I saw, um, you know, went to a church where the pastor had been recorded and just showed it on a screen. And I was like, no, yeah. you know, no. And, and I knew why no. And not that God isn't doing good things in all those other churches. But I, I was just, I knew that like this is the model I had found mm -hmm. was that I could just follow the, the New Testament. Yeah. So it was really, uh, it was amazing. So then I came back and I did a sabbatical report for my church and, I was like, we have, I'm like, this is what God's given me from the sabbatical. And I just put one word up on the screen. It just said reformation. Mm. I'm like, we need to help our church follow the scripture wherever God has spoken about the church and the scriptures. How was that received? I, I think people were a little bit shocked. But then again, like for me, how can you argue with if it's just in the Bible? Mm -hmm. So like, you know, elders, it's like once you put the elder glasses on, you're like, oh, it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. So then you can't unsee it. And so it's like, as long as it's in the Bible, then like, why, would, why wouldn't we listen to what Jesus has to say yeah. about his church? How many members did you have at that time? <sighs> More or less. I would be uh, maybe 400. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, that's a big ship to turn. How, I mean, not the biggest. Yeah, not the biggest. H how many elders did you have? Uh, there was like like maybe 10 or 12. So and, they had elders. And so you were elders and congregational. You weren't like deacon run or anything like no, that. No, we were okay. elder. Yeah, elder-led congregational. Okay. Was it, did you present it to your elders first or to the whole congregation? Um, I think it just, I just came back just a big report. <laughs> yeah, right, right. And the elders were like, okay, okay well, all right. Yeah, no, senior pastor, I mean, okay, cool. Yeah. Cool, cool. Uh, and so you began to implement that how quickly? Uh, over the next 10 years. Oh, okay. So, so you I were slow, like, we need to change, but it's well, you're not going to blow everything up. I didn't blow everything up. Okay. I just slowly turned the ship. I mean, you know, this is New England, and New England, you know, like you know, you know how many New Englanders it takes to change the light bulb, right? How many change, right? So that's the answer. <laughs> okay, they just don't. Right. They don't. They're just like really yeah. change suspicious. They're really slow. You know, the British are still coming. One if by land, two if by sea. And so, like, people are really cautious about change. So then you just have to slowly plant seeds, talk about things, and then slowly turn the ship and, and build consent. It's actually healthy. You have to build consensus. Yeah, right. And you have to show people. It's not just like, hey, listen to me because I'm the pastor. You have to be like, this is why. Here's what the Bible says. Hey, think about it. And then slowly but surely they get it. 
Well, then I just have a question to ask yeah, you. Yeah. Did you know that all ants are females? All ants are females. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You didn't know that? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I'll, I'll, I can prove it to you if you yeah, do. Yeah. Okay, so if they were males, they'd be called uncles. <sighs> Your dad joke game is on. Point. Yes. Well, let me ask you this. What's the hottest letter <laughs> in the alphabet? <laughs> what? B. Uh-huh. Because it turns the oil into boil, baby. <laughs> back to church revitalization. You go back. You say reformation. You uh -huh. got a 10-year plan. Uh -huh. What's the first thing you change? Um, I th I don't remember. I, I think the first thing I started doing with the elders was just shifting from, the, I mean, we had elders, but they were more of a board of directors model, okay. more of a trustees model. And, and sort of like, hey, how do we all learn as a team to start shepherding? Um, and uh, other changes came out of that. I think a burden for training up pastors. So we eventually started a pastoral apprenticeship program. A burden for uh, more of a culture of discipleship in the church versus just kind of lots of programs, lots of activity. So being in general, I, I think when you really start looking at Scripture and you start asking the question, what does the Bible say? it just puts you, your footing, your weight in a more intentional direction and an intentionality about critically thinking about things as opposed to just, hey, how many people came? Right. A lot, yeah. it was good. Right. right. What was the biggest change you made? Like this, here's a pragmatic thing that we, we got rid of in light of this uh, change of mindset. I, I think one of the big things we eventually, it took a while, was um, once we had room, moving to one worship service. Oh, you were doing two. Yeah, we we're doing two. Small building, New England. Yeah. 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 But but even before that, uh and then we, and and we built a new space. Okay. So then we could all fit in it. Oh, so okay. that that was the change there. Okay. Um so you ended up writing the book because through that whole process you yeah. met Jonathan Lehman. Yes. Okay. Were you just at like a conference for scholars? Uh no. Uh he may have been, I wasn't. Okay. Um, yeah, I was, uh, no, but I did. I, I knew him through, because I went to that weekend or I started meeting some people at Capitol Hill Baptist. Right. And I remember we had gone to something together and we were in the airport leaving. And so I'm just sitting there with him for 15, 20 minutes. And he's like, and I think I'd written a couple articles for them. And he's like, Jeremy, you ever thought about a book? And yeah. so I was like, no. Nope. That's a pretty decent micro impression. That's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the CHBC guys are good. They're easy to. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyway. so I was like, I was like, yeah. I was like, mm, not really. And he's like, hey, you, should, you should think about a book. And I was like, on what? Like, I have no, I've never had an aspiration to be an author of anything. Yeah. I'm like, just, I can, like, I can wear these shirts yes. for sure. Yeah. Or you want me to write a book about shirts? Because I'll do that. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's yeah, right. It, that's, Vacation that's shirts. Yeah. And so so we kind of were like, Wait, hold on. Were you wearing those in, <laughs> in Boston or no? These? Yeah. No, no. This is man. a Florida thing. This is contextualization. Okay, bro. right. Okay, okay. <laughs> uh, that may or may not be the last time I make fun of your outfit it's, for the rest of the interview. It's okay. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. It's, uh, yeah, I love it. I mean, I got to Florida and, and this is what, like, dude, they literally dress like this, shorts and these kind of shirts yeah. in church. So I'm like, great. It's like this is how I go to elders meetings. And yeah, stuff. if you it's wore a blazer, it would they they wouldn't even be able to hear the gospel from. Yeah, you. yeah. That, no, they would be like, "Why are you wearing?" This? That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It's a very laid back culture. So he says, well, "Why don't you write a book?" Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and say, I was like, "Why?" And yeah. you know, and blah blah blah. So then, and then he's like, "What would you write on?" I, I had a couple ideas. I was like, "I could write about elders," and he's like, "Well, what would you write?" And I was like, "Well, I said, you know, the thing I I feel like my guys need is just a very." user-friendly kind of field manual for how to be an elder. And we used Strock uh, before that. He wrote a book on elders, which is better than the book I wrote, but it's just thicker and it's more complex. So when I was getting- And it's it, not really congregational. It's not I think he comes from an elder rule background. Yeah, that's right. So he, um, and, and and when I would give it to my elders, I'd be like, all right, we're gonna read this chapter, we're gonna read this, read this. Yeah. So, so I was like, okay, my guys just need something simpler uh, that I could just hand them yeah. and say, hey, this is what being an elder is. Yeah. And, and it's something that I knew. They're like, oh, I could actually right. do that. Mm -hmm. um, and as much as you want all your readers, I mean, all your elders to be like super big readers, like they're dudes and they're working busy jobs and whatever. So um, so that, so that I was like, I could do that. And he's like, well, let's think about that. And like literally in 15 minutes, we had all the chapters nailed down. I was mm -hmm. like, well, you could write about that, that, and that. And he's like, okay, okay, scratch it. He's like, there you go. There's your book. 
And then I, I looked at it and I was like, I actually can, I mean, anyone could write, any pastor mm-hmm. who has elders could have written on that. Yeah. And so I just was like, okay, I guess I'm the one that's going to do it. Yeah. So I did it. And, um, and so, yeah, that's how that was birthed. I've come to realize once I've peeked behind the curtain of book publishing that editors write more of the book than the author sometimes. Uh, don't be modest or non-modest. <laughs> what would you like? How much of your book made it through the to the final? It it's it's mostly mine. What I would say though is the uh, the the editor did it, and it, it was like when you like make a piece of pottery, then you glaze it, mm-hmm. and you come out. And, and you look at it, you're like, dang, that looks amazing. Yeah. That's what the editor did. Like after he wrote it, I he made me sound a lot smarter than I really am. Yeah. So a good, ed- like they always say, a good editor really makes a book. It's so true. Yeah. I am a very good editor. Yeah. All right. So let's walk through the book. Yeah. I don't have a copy with me. <laughs> Neither do so, I. <laughs> so you walk us through your book. <laughs> okay. Chapter one. Here we go. Okay. Uh, so um, I, I framed uh, eight chapters around things that are part of the elder's job description. So chapter one is don't assume. That means uh, don't just assume you're an elder. In other words, it's look at the elder qualifications in scripture. Okay. And, and let's, so it's kind of like a slow down. Let's look at this. Like, should you be an elder? Yeah. Um, The second is smell like sheep. Okay. Well, let's, let's stop on number one. Okay. Don't assume. What was the idea behind that? Was, were you seeing guys who were just too gung ho or who thought that it was, I think um, in my own context, there would often be a kind of like, well, that guy's been here a while Uh and he's a good guy. Yeah. And he may have been or may not have been, but um, maybe he didn't meet the qualifications. I think I tell the story in the book of this one guy. This bro is like uber servant. He does everything in the church. He was, it's just, and he's a godly man, but he has no desire to teach the last thing he'd ever want to do is lead a, commu- a Bible study group. He doesn't do any of that. He's like, it's not my thing. And so I'm like, well, y- you can't be an elder because you have to be apt to teach in some way. Not that I doubted his theology. Did he want to be an elder? He, he didn't want to be an elder. People wanted him to be an elder. Yeah, his name kept coming up because they're like, he's so good. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah. but that. And, so, and, I, and also I think just sort of this idea that like elders, you know, you kind of get up to senior management if you've been in the company long enough. And, and I'm like, we got to stop putting a value statement on elders over deacons or that over anything else. Like this is an office. He sounds like the perfect deacon. Oh, he is. He's like super deacon. Yeah. Yeah. He's oozes deacon. Yeah. And it would have, it would have been bad for him and for the church for him not to be doing his deacon things. Yeah. That's good. Have you ever found the opposite young guys who feel like they are entitled? Like I'm I'm like, I'm, I'm getting it and I'm going to be an elder. Yeah. That's, you know, that's that's the other side of, you know, you aspire to be an elder. So there has to be that inward desire, but it has to have that external confirmation, right? right? You got to have other people being like, yeah, we see it. Yeah. 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 Chapter number two. Uh, it's called Smell Like Sheep. Mm. And that's more... Our a, guys use that phrase all the time, by the way. Really? It, yeah. It's it, it's such a powerful illustration. It just, it's, it's part yeah. of our culture now. We use that language. So thank yeah. you for that. Yeah. And actually, interestingly, uh, Thabiti wrote a book on elders and deacons and he wrote about smelling like sheep. No, I think he wrote an article. Okay. And so I was already had like write, written the the chapter and then he used the same language. So yeah. I was like, oh bro, can I use this? My, like yeah. I didn't get it from you, but yeah. I was like, yeah. so anyway. Okay. Yeah. So I think maybe he like got it and then like beamed it to me or something. Okay. You're right. Yeah. But anyway, yeah, but uh, it, it's, and really the idea is it's, it's not so much like, well, I guess it is a task, but it's just more, conceiving of the elder job as being among the people. And uh, because I think a lot of our guys and a lot of elders just generally, they think being an elder is showing up at the meeting Mm. and voting on stuff. And that's, you know, you've done your job if you showed up the meeting once a month and voted on stuff. Right. So to to give a real life example of what it looks like to elder at our elders meeting, we go through the membership directory, have conversations. And if there's like, more than one meeting where as we're working through the directory, a particular elder is like, I don't know. You know, like, I don't know what's going on with anybody. Well, what are you doing? Like the meeting is where we get together to like collectively focus on things that we should have already been doing independently with members of the church. We should already be active, be in there. Yeah. 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 And, and even when you're looking for elders, uh, I think it's really important 
to be looking for guys who are already, already doing, doing that, that yeah, stuff in the right. church. So you're like, hey, look at that community group leader or look at that guy. He's always mm-hmm. like tracking people down. So I had a guy, a, a church planner who actually ended up planning a church. I won't tell you about how that went, but he planted a church <laughs> who told me, bro, I just don't like people. Wow. How is it possible that he made it through like church planning cohorts and all this stuff and planted a church and it never came out or maybe it did come out and somebody didn't care, but he was like, yeah, not just introverted, but yeah. I don't, like I just people. don't like people. Yeah. yeah. Cause that's, you can be introverted, extroverted. Yeah. That's problematic. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. That's okay. a non-starter. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So basically you should smell like the sheep. That means that you should be around the sheep so much that like you think about first Peter, right? Like yeah. shepherd the flock of God that is, among you. Among you. Yeah. Yes. You're not distant from them. You're not above them. You are with them. You're with them. Just right. like an actual shepherd. Yeah. Yeah. That's the job. It's, yeah. a, it's a hands-on job. So when I have a little bit of BO, that's just what I tell people. I'm yeah. like, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm a shepherd. It's I'm out in the me. field. It's, it's not the people me. I'm with. Yeah. It's God's calling on my life. I'm a little funky. You Smell know? the call. <laughs> Smell Man, the call. Man, brother. Hey, note that one. Uh, I'm not kidding, Luke. Literally right down the <laughs> I am over you. Write that down. <laughs> uh, number three. Yes. Uh, number three is teach the word. Okay. Um, so, yeah, being able to teach. Uh, so yeah. you have to be able to get up in a pulpit, like preach like Spurgeon. Um, almost. Okay. No, actually not. Oh, okay. Uh, you have to be able to uh, uh, hold to sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. So, and what I tell our elders is, is instructing people in sound doctrine and holding the sound doctrine can take place in a lot of different venues. Mm -hmm. It can take place in a pulpit. It can take place in a Sunday school class. You can lead a community group. You might just be someone who sits down over coffee Mm -hmm. and does one-to-one Bible reading with someone. So, so it's, it's not uh, a gift of oratorical brilliance. It's the ability to hold the sound doctrine and instruct and encourage people in it. That's right. Yeah. In any group of people, any kind of organization, from the Navy SEALs to local church pastors, there's going to be a bell curve. Mm -hmm. You're going to have the best and the brightest. Then you're going to have the guys who are like, oh, you're a Navy SEAL? Like, how did you? (laughs) Yeah, right. But like, he made it. Yeah, somehow. Yeah. Would you say, I mean, I think that that's true of elders. Yeah. You're going to have like your standout when it's apt to teach. You, You point to this guy and you say, like him. Then you have other guys where some people might go, huh. Yeah, but like you know, you've seen him lead his family in devotionals. Yeah, you've, yeah, you've, yeah. you know that he's doing one-on-one discipleship with guys, and he's probably even when he teaches a Sunday school, it's probably not fantastic, but it's faithful. If there's a doctrinal issue that comes up in the church, you know he's gonna, you know, make the right decisions. He's gonna read, even if he has to spend more time reading and writing than other guys do, he's gonna get there. So, is that fair to think about? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I just think um, maybe the way to categorize that is is different uh, amounts of gifting. Yeah. So you know, eight eight people can have a gift of teaching, but one person could be like a ridiculous teacher, yeah. another guy could be faithful, and maybe he's not going to ever be invited to speak at some huge conference. Yeah. But like, man, that bro's an elder. Yeah, yeah, and I think and I think it's true in like kind of all the different uh, gifting gifts, and, yeah. and we really, I mean, we just put a premium on gifting in our culture, like a b- amount of gifting yeah. more than the scripture does. I agree. Yeah, chapter number four. Um, okay, I forget the order at this point. Yeah. Um, uh, some of the other chapters are lead together, so plurality. Okay. So we talk about that that it's uh, that it's something where the Lord brings together a plurality of elders. To your point, if you think about the duties an elder has. Some elders are going to be stronger in some of those duties than others, mm-hmm. hence the value of plurality. So, like, I've had some elders who are really good teachers, good doctrinal students. They're just theologically sharp. Mm-hmm. I've had others who are, like, have, like, compassion coming out their ears, mm-hmm. and you need those guys. Uh, and then I've had others who are just, like, crazy good leaders. They're able to see a situation, you know, they, they can get to the heart of it, and they have the courage to be like, guys, we must do this. Yeah. And, and if you don't have all of those kind of leanings operating fully, like you're just going to be imbalanced as an elder team. I'm thinking about my four elders. We have another one who's on sabbatical. Uh, Shane, high school principal, administratively really helpful. Yeah. There was a, an administrative question that we had in an email exchange. 
uh, with one email, with one sentence in one email, he clarified the issue, caused us to go in the other direction. Then we have Russell. He is the evangelism apologetics guy, like the logical, like a computer. Yes. Uh, but not the most get to the heart preacher or teacher guy. Then we have Will, assistant pastor, obviously coming into his own as a counselor the best listener, supremely patient, asks all the right questions, has a heart to see that developed in the church. And then you have me, mm -hmm. not nothing, but, <laughs> but you see all those different giftings yes. Uh, yes. coming together. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. The way that the Lord has designed multiple elders to work together in the church is truly a mosaic. One of the things I enjoy, honestly, is whenever we have new elders rotate on, is it's a little bit like Christmas, where I'm like, I wonder what they're what gonna, your thing is going to be, what they're going to yeah. be, and you kind of like fun to like. It's sort of like a movie where you know they bring like the twelve guys together, you know, Ocean's Twelve or whatever, Ocean Eleven, yeah, and you know like they're going to have skills, and you're like, okay, that's the hacker guy, and that's this guy, and yeah. except knowing that you know, like Paul says to the elders in Acts twenty, like you know, shepherd the flock God, which the Holy Spirit has made you overseer. So that sense that. The Holy Spirit, uh, Lord willing, has appointed these these men, yeah. and so it's like, what things has the Holy Spirit put in on the table, and what providentially is coming down the road in the next few years where we're going to be like, oh, that's why you're here. Yes, and that happens. Yes, and it's so cool. It is so cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you ever, just while we're on the subject, new elder? First of all, you got to give them time. Yeah. You can't be like, okay, new elder, this is your thing. I mean, you can do that. If there's a need, obviously go to meet the need. But there's a sense in which you got to give guys a little bit of wiggle room to figure out where they are particularly gifted, right? Yeah, yeah that's right. I, I remember Garrett Kell, when he first went on staff at CHBC, went to Mark and said like, what am I doing here? And Mark was like, if you're really a pastor, you'll figure it out. You know, he, did, he wasn't assigned something. He was like, well... My schedule is not full. And he's like, if you're really a pastor, your schedule will fill up and you will find out soon enough where people are really bearing, well, like where fruit is being born in light of your ministry. I thought that was really wise. Yeah. I know that it's not always that easy. Yeah. You know, big church, big staff, a little bit more wiggle room, but yeah. I was going to ask you something else. Oh, okay. Yeah. Have you appointed an elder that you regretted? Um... Not regret in like the non-Christian sense. Obviously, God yeah. is sovereign. We're like, yada, maybe yada. that wasn't the right fit. Yeah. 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 Um, and where, where you just think, yeah, or you didn't see something about them or you saw a weakness like we all have, yeah. but you didn't realize it would become uh -huh. this big. Yeah. Um, and and those, those are times, I, you know, where you, you just have to, I don't know, you, you have a challenge yeah. and you have to work through it and yeah. bear with one another in love. How long have you been a pastor? Uh, 27 years. You think you'll probably retire as a pastor? Yeah, most likely. So let's just say nice round number. You spend 40 years pastoring okay. and hopefully most of that time raising up other men uh, to, to lead. Yep. The odds of you not getting, you know, something wrong is zero. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, like, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, the wisest among us. Oh, yeah have appointed guys and they get, they get flack. Like, how could, how could you have made that mistake? Yeah, oh, well you, he's not God. You see, <laughs> he's not omniscient. Yeah, you know, yeah. we do the best we can. We look at the character qualifications. That's right. We look at a person's life. We are not quick to lay hands. That's right. Right. And, and so we, we do our best in the same way that we do that with baptism and membership. Hiring staff. Hiring staff. Yeah. It's like, it's, yeah. it's hard. Yeah. Yeah. We're doing the best we can with what we got. Yeah. <laughs> what we got ain't much. No, what we got is a lot. We That's got right. the Spirit's help. We, we got, got the, the gospel. Help. We got the That's scriptures. Right. Yeah, caught myself there. Yeah. But, All right. it, but it is. It's back to the ragtag thing. The okay. Lord uses just these clay vessels, you know, and these imperfect people. Uh, but by his grace, you know, you know, in our weakness, his strength is made perfect. So I think that's... That's what he does. <laughs> Sorry, that die mountain do is really good. Did I interrupt your heart? No, was, <laughs> your heart do the do. It's cool. Um, <laughs> have you read Team of Rivals? No. What uh, is this? Uh, who's it by? <laughs> Luke, it you about? don't know. You don't know how to read. Is it about sports? No. <laughs> uh, Dorothy. I want to. No, that's not. You got it, Luke. Wizard of Oz. Team of Rivals. This is about Luke and, uh, Lincoln's cabinet. 
Oh, interesting. Uh, oh, I've heard about this yes, book. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. It's so fantastic. I can't remember the name of the author. Yeah, yeah, that's. Good. I did smoke a lot of crystal meth when I was younger, so <laughs> my brain is not really. Doris yeah, Goodwin. Doris Kearns Goodwin, Team of Rivals, Team of Rivals. When uh -huh. I was reading that book, it's all about how Lincoln managed to hold together this coalition of people that should not have held together, mm -hmm. but it, he saw it as integral to make to make it through the war. Yeah. To keep this group together because this person had this strength and this person yeah. had this strength and this and like we need all of them here together in this crucial moment. And as I was working through that book, I just kept thinking this is such a good common grace example of Jesus with his disciples and yeah. of every pastor working with with elders in in his ministry. Just Jesus brought together people that should not have been together. You got the zealot and you got the tax collector but they all followed him and he was able to wisely lead them. Yeah, there were some kerfuffles mm -hmm. along the way, but he managed it. You know? you know, in fact, I would say it's in those moments where you you start running into either personality conflicts or bad fits or something where where you or or just like challenges with working with elders that you really are tested, do I really believe that plurality of elder leadership is Jesus's plan for the church? And do I really trust that God works through it? And and there's times where you're like, yeah, it's so beautiful, it's rocking. And there's other times where you're like, I think it'd be more efficient if I just made all the decisions. But I trust that this is Jesus's plan for Jesus's church. I'm so glad you said that. There are so many times in pastoral ministry where I go, I think it would just be easier if we did X. Yeah whether it's plurality. I mean, think about meaningful membership and discipline. Yeah. Think about how much easier, in, in one sense, in the worst sense, from the eternal perspective, yeah, yeah. but from a carnal perspective. From an think, efficiency from standpoint. An uh, yeah, so-called efficiency. So-called right? efficiency. Imagine right. how much easier it would be if you didn't practice meaningful church membership. Yeah. It would be a breeze. Maybe right? so much you know, easier. They come in, they go out. Somebody leaves, you go, eh, you know. Numbers are up. Numbers are up. Yeah, we're doing good. Do you, there's a somebody's not showing up for church for a year, and rather than bringing it before the church and saying like, "Hey, we're gonna discipline this person," you just go, "Eh, they're not here. Take them off the roll." Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, next chapter. Um, and there's another chapter in there. I'm forgetting the numbered order. Hey, don't uh, worry called about Seek it. Seek the strays. Yes. So the elders' job of well, just what you're talking well, about. Yeah, that's right. When people are not showing up finding out where they are what's going on you know tracking them down uh seeing are they are they somewhere else are they in another church yeah. um during the hurricane we had this on steroids so we um yeah we had a almost category five hurricane in uh, september 28th 2022 in boston uh just south of boston uh fort my just outside of fort myers so i uh, passed around sanibel island so the, the eye of the hurricane went just to the left of sanibel island so the right arm of it which is the the scary part, like like sent a 13-foot storm surge that went all over the island, covered everything. Uh, so it was crazy, and people were just dispersed. So the, the problem was we, didn't, we were like, where is everyone? What's going on? Are they coming back? And so we had our, our team of their proto-elders at that point. We hadn't quite shifted to elders, but they, they literally just started tracking down every single person just mm -hmm. to find out, like, like, first of all, I want to make sure everyone is alive. Thank God they were. But then it was like, where are you? Yeah. What are you doing? Are you coming back? Are you? How's your house? How can we pray for you? Yeah. And uh, and it was just super heavy. But it was that, like, we need to keep track of every name on this list because they're the people that God's given us. And some of them, you know, we called some people because we're still. I'm still kind of new there and they hadn't really done this a lot recently. You know, we called some people and they're like, I haven't been to church for eight years. Yeah. We're like, okay, well. Membership. Thanks for letting us know. But other people. And just to be clear for our viewers, you are new to this church. Yeah, I've been there uh, three and a half years. Yeah. So they've had membership before I came, but it wasn't. It it wasn't as um, I would say, not quite as intentional as it is now. Where we're really trying to. Really, the goal is that the people who are members of the church are actively involved in the church. Yeah. You know, they're act, they're actually participating in the life of the church, unless they're shut in. Yeah. Or something like that. A lot of people were swept away and uh for all kinds of reasons yeah and and i mean it's just it, it's honestly been gut-wrenching just Ugh. seeing people go but um but you know i mean it's, it's just out of your control like yeah. what are you gonna do yeah someone's like i literally can't rebuild my house yeah 
with the insurance they've given me and the new building codes. So like I'm leaving the area permanently. Mm. It's just gut wrenching. Yeah. So yeah. How many members, uh, like active members did you have before the hurricane? Um, I don't know. Active. Our membership list reflected what I would say active and inactive people. Okay. Uh, I'll say this, that um, before the hurricane, in terms of the number of people on our membership rolls before the hurricane, and then we did all that follow-up work, uh-huh. we're estimating that we'll lose 40% of our membership. Okay. Yeah. On a Sunday morning, how many people were there? Um, so, okay, here's another weird thing. So our church is, is uh, unique because... Well, not unique, but it's different than most churches because we're a seasonal church. Oh, uh-huh, that's right. Yeah, people are down during the winter because it's beautiful. Then they go up north in the summer. So in the summer, uh, we are like 250 people. And in the winter, it's like 600 people. So a lot, wow. of, people, a lot of people come down. Okay, yeah. that's kind of like Ocean City. Yeah. 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 Or it's other, a very any, unique yeah, tourist a, church. Which makes it interesting for membership. It makes yeah. it interesting for shepherding and elders. It's kind of a puzzle to solve. Wow. Like how do you do that meaningfully? Yeah. If someone's in your church for five months yeah. and then they go back to their church in Michigan for seven months. Yeah. So like, how do you do that meaningfully? The cool thing is about the people in our churches when they're down, like they're, they're, they're fully in. into it. Yeah. Yeah. They're into it. Okay. So it's cool. Let's it's just let's, a different church. Yeah. That's, I feel like I want to unpack that, but let's, let's hold off on that. Um, Okay, let's think through different kinds of sheep that need to be tracked down. Okay. You, you may have the seriously ill that you got to keep up with. Try not to forget about them. Even if you're not the one who's doing the visitation, you want to make sure that they're loved and cared for. Yes, absolutely. Yes. And that can even just be a church member. And in fact, in, in, in many cases, it probably should be church members. Yeah. Uh, then you have the non-attender due to sin which they never say, hey, listen, like I'm deep in sin. I'm not coming around. They'll usually feign something else. Yeah, so that's another kind. Let's say that there is a member who is really seriously struggling with mental illness and you are maintaining hope that this member is actually a Christian and they have pockets of coming back and being faithful and then pockets of being away and being troubled you still got to care for them. You got to figure that out. So they're just pa- pastorally. It's not just like, are they there on Sunday or are they not there on Sunday? There's all kinds of things that yes. could be going on. Yes. And and so that's why taking a blanket approach, either of um, license and just being like, whatever, or legalism where it's like, well, you weren't here for four weeks. So off the list you go. Like neither is helpful. You have to really um, you have to be small like sheep. And I think the elders have to go and just find out like what's going on with this person. Yeah. And you have to take it case by case because these are real people. That's right. And their lives real are all complex. Yeah, real souls. Yeah. Their lives are complex. Thank God he doesn't deal with me in a blanket way. <laughs> you know, he's like tailored his grace to me, um, you know, as yeah. I need it. And so I think the same thing, like we need to be. So so I th- I'd say our elders, when it comes to just like people who aren't coming to the church, we're patient, yeah. we're we just we just keep reaching out. We're doing phone calls. We're, you know, what we really want for everyone in the church is that they would be active members of a gospel preaching church, whether ours or another church. Yeah. And of course, we love them and wish they'd stay with ours. But if not ours for whatever reason, then like be in a church. Yeah, that's right. We're not the only church. We say that all the time. Yeah. Hey, love you. I don't know why you're not coming back, but what can we do to help get you into? Yeah. Yeah. Another gospel preaching, Bible believing church. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, our mission that Jesus has given us is to make disciples. That's right. It's not to grow our church. Amen. So, yeah. yeah. Um, you tell me if this is stated too strongly. Okay. I don't think it is. Okay. It's an it's an elders meeting. I don't know how you guys do like issues meetings, member care meeting. Yeah, we kind so of we break do. them up. Okay. Too, yeah. yeah. So let's say it's a member care meeting. Okay. We have the membership directory, which, by the way. Pastors, if you're listening, you should have a membership directory. Oh, yeah. yeah. It, how, how can you shepherd your flock yeah. if you don't literally know who the sheep are? Like with their faces, especially if your church is larger. Yeah. You know, I want to be able to put a face with a name. Uh, so our church is getting to the size now where, where we can't go through the entire directory every time we do that. Yeah. But, I mean, we're still a very small church. We're like 92 members. Yeah. But you should be able to, if you wanted to, with all of your elders present, walk through that membership directory and somebody in that room should be able to talk about the spiritual condition of every single person in that directory. Not as comprehensively as if you were God, but there shouldn't ever be a time where you get to someone and you go. And everyone's like, no one knows no what's one going on crickets. with Jenny. Right. You know, like, 
Alive, dead, what? Too strong? No. Okay. Yeah. And we're not there. Yeah. We're still getting there. Aspirational. It's an aspirational yeah. goal, but 100%. Was it hard for you to, I mean, you you spent how long in Boston? Uh, 20 years there. Packing the cab by the habit. Yeah. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> you spent 20 years in Boston pushing the rock, getting the church where you wanted it to be, elders well-trained and discipled, yeah. doing the, training and equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. And then you move down to another church where you're like, okay, let's do the whole rigmarole again. Yeah. Was that tough? Yeah, actually, I did it twice because I first went to the Middle East and That's pastored a right. church there for four that. years. Then I came and and now I'm doing it again. I didn't know you Florida. spoke Arabic. Ah, uh, shway shway. <laughs> okay, holla yeah. at your boy. Where, where where were you over there? Uh, Abu, Dhabi, Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates. In four years. Yeah, four years. Just the climate was too much for you. I love the. I loved everything about okay. it. Okay, so yeah. you came back. Yeah, so I was like, I love it so much. I'm leaving. Yeah, why'd yeah. you leave? Uh, family things. Okay. Our kids going to college. Uh, parents getting older. Yeah. Yeah, and God just raised up a phenomenal replacement mm. for me. Who was your replacement? Uh, Aubrey Sequeira. Oh, yeah, yeah, that dude's a rock star. Yeah, I know. No, he literally was. He was in a band? He was in one of the, the biggest rock bands in India. Really? Yeah, he was the bass player. Oh, slap this at the was, bass. Yeah, this was back in his, like, <laughs> druggy rock days. I didn't know he had druggy rock days. Yeah, you would like him. Uh, well, dude, uh, okay, all right. Remind <laughs> me to bring this back up later, okay, because you're blowing my mind right now. He's uh, so cool. Okay, yeah. yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, so, so, but yeah, you did it twice. Either way, I mean, is that, is, are you like, does that get you going? Like, all right, let's, let's rebuild the church again. I think, um, you know, I would say the Lord, I think, has called me and, and wired me to do it. I don't like having to start over because it's it's so much work yeah. just being in a new church. And it's hard on a church having a new pastor. I mean, I feel bad for my church that they have to endure me. I mean, you know, it's like a new pastor and you got to get used to me. And it's just hard. It's hard with a new pastor, new church. So why did you leave Boston specifically to go to the Middle East? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Also just tired of Boston, right? Uh tired of the winters for sure. But but I just yeah, it's the worst. So but I um you know what it was? Uh so in a weird way, every church I've been in, I've always had a sense of assignment. Mm -hmm. That I'm like, I'm supposed to be here. And I'd get other other opportunities every once in a blue moon in Boston. And I'd be like, This is where I'm supposed to be, who cares? Yeah. And then I just started getting a sense of of releasing in my heart, like Something else needs to happen. I don't know what it is. Like for the first time in like, you know, over a decade, I started having this kind of restlessness. And then this thing happened in Abu Dhabi. And I was like, I came on, told my wife, I'm like, I need to apply for the Middle East. She's yeah. like, okay, midlife crisis. But <laughs> <laughs> She's like, go ahead, apply, we'll get out of your system. And then we'll be happy in Boston the rest of our lives. And uh, or in Massachusetts. So then, but then I got the job. And Were you not in Boston? I always just say Boston. Yeah. Uh, well, I say Boston too. Okay. And my wife's from Massachusetts, so she's always like, we're not from Boston. I'm like, no one knows. But it's the South Shore. Okay, technically the South Shore of Boston. Okay. If you go halfway between Boston and Cape Cod, that's where we were, South Shore. Wow, that's really boring. Yeah. And that's, I, I knew it was like great radio. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, uh, next chapter. Or we don't know if it's next, but another chapter. Um, would be uh, prayer, praying for the church. Yeah. Yeah, elders, you know, the apostles. You know, you take care of the ministry of the tables. We'll devote ourselves to the ministry of the word and prayer. Acts chapter six. Yeah. 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 Uh, we just did a panel together. Yes. At an event where I embarrassed myself by crying in front of, room, of a room full of men. But it basically, it was beautiful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, any advice for me, brother? I just, I, I always struggle with praying as much as I should. One, I'll, let me tell you one thing I've done and then you can give me any, any advice. I've tried to build rhythms of prayer into my life so that whether I feel like it or not, I'm going to be doing it. So like if we had an elders meeting or, or anything, like if me and the guys around the office are talking about anything and it doesn't end with a prayer, I think everyone's going to feel strange about that. And that's because I've tried to build a culture there where it's just we're always doing it, regardless of whether or not in our hearts. Wait, hold on, that sounds bad. But you get what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Trying to, wait, he's like, maybe I do. I don't know. I'm like, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know what it's like to feel cold, to feel distant, to yeah. feel tired, yeah. to not feel like praying. Yeah. But when you build that rhythm in your life, you at least are making sure that that muscle doesn't atrophy. Yeah. You know? 
Yeah. All right. That's all I've got to say now. I'm rambling. You, <laughs> you tell me. Well, I me. agree. I, uh, I, I mean, I'm just a very uh, task oriented, get it done kind of person. And so if I don't force myself to do prayer things and have prayer segments of my life, like I could easily go through weeks just like on Jeremy power because I'm just like kind of guy. So, so, you know, go for, I go for a walk in the morning on the beach. I walk my dog. I take prayer, my, you know, list along. And one thing I've, it, that's been one of the more fruitful things I've done, tying this back into eldering, is I just pray on my own for 10, 12, 15 members of the church a day. And then I, I just take, it just takes 15 minutes or so, and I just write them a text saying, praying for you today, and I just list what I prayed for. And I've actually found that's been one of the most fruitful ways to pray for the church and just let them know I'm praying for them. Then they'll be like, I'm like, anything else I can pray for? And they'll be like, yeah, pray for this. And so it's just a quick thing, texting, and and you can keep up to date with people. And they really appreciate it. Do you do you do what Mark does? Read the text, think what you're going to pray for, and then copy and paste it? Or do you pray something individual for each person? Something individual. Sometimes it's the same thing. Okay. Uh, it just kind of depends. Some of it's just like something on my heart for the church. Yeah. So I, I, you know, yeah, it's not just like, hey, here's, you know, the fortune cookie I found for prayer. Yeah. And I just, you know, send it out a hundred times. Well, it could be better than that. You know, you're reading, yeah. you know, Hebrew 6. Yeah. You're going to drink from the water of, you know, the rain of God's word this Sunday. I, I pray that, you know, and then boop, 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 boop. You don't do that. No. No. Um, yeah. And some, unless it's something I'm really burdened for, as I think of each person. Okay. Like one of the things I, I prayed for several people uh, today when I sent it out was just that that they would love... God uppermost today and desire to obey his commands. Yeah. Okay. You know, yeah. and, and then, yeah. you know, and I'll, and if I know something else about them, Hey, also praying for your son, who's having surgery and, yeah. or whatever. And how else can I pray for you? Yeah. That's, that's been one. a really fruitful thing. Yeah. Simple 15 minutes. They feel loved. Shepherds. Yeah. And yeah. they are. I love them. Yeah, that's right. I love them. Uh, but you know, it's possible for you to love them and for, for them not to know it, especially the larger the church yes. gets. Yeah. So it's and, and if you're thing. introverted like me, okay, um, you you just you, you know you, you have all these things inside. You know you live inside your head when you're introvert. Okay, and so you have all these. I know you, I'm telling you what introverts are like, dude. I'm so jealous. I would kill to be an introvert. You should. Okay. I feel like yeah. I feel like introversion, extroversion is like something's off, dude. It is. It is. Okay. I mean, I, yeah, yeah, confirmed. Okay. Like you get to process all your stupid <laughs> thoughts inside your head. <laughs> and I'm just over here like, blah, 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 blah. does that make sense? And they're like, no, you're an idiot. I'm like, no, that's tracks. Okay. But you're a great host. Oh, thank you. Yes. Yeah, so that's good. Yeah. So, so it's really good. And, and I think that's right. I, I think one of the things about, you know, if you're a pastor who's, I mean, there's hope for introverted pastors that, that you know, but you have to find ways because it's like, it's like all in my head, like I love these people. Mm -hmm. Like I, I stayed for through a hurricane for them. Like I, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm literally ready to take a bullet for yeah, these people. That's right. But I'm not always the best at gushing that out. Right. So I have to find ways to make what's in here go out there. Like for example, when was the last time you told me you loved me? Huh? I wasn't just right before this. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that, maybe it wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Before we move on to the, uh, is there a next chapter? Let's ask about the rings you're wearing. Uh huh. Yeah, these. Are you just a man jewelry guy? <laughs> I I do like jewelry. You like male jewelry? <laughs> yes. I don't wear a lot. <laughs> do you have a necklace on as well? I don't. Have Would a you wear on. a necklace? Uh, it depends. I might. Would you wear a man a male bracelet like a gold bracelet? I I have those. Yes. Dude. Well, here's another thing. This is like a holdover from. <laughs> Even though I'm, you just did that right there, I'm, like I'm, we yeah, get it, see, you wear rings. You know, real Are nice. you Italian? Uh, no. Okay. Yeah, I. Uh, yeah, I'm kind of. Uh, yeah, I'm just sort of a, a mutt when it comes to fashion and things. Yeah. But, well, I grew up in the Southwest, so I love like Native American jewelry. Oh, dude, it's so good. So when we were in Albuquerque, yes, you dude. were like, "Give me a turquoise ring, baby." <laughs> I literally did. <laughs> oh man! <laughs> literally, when I got there, I uh -huh. saw a guy with a ponytail and like dream catcher earrings yeah. and a turquoise ring, and I texted all the guys back home, and I was like, "It's really true," and I just yeah. made fun of it. But oh, this yeah. is you. I love that stuff. Yeah, that's right. Man. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I'm sorry, man. That's okay. Uh, <laughs> but I was—I get stuff for my wife, and, and and the other thing, raising about Native American jewelry, just to go off on it. Yeah, sure. Why it's not? really nice, but it's not as expensive as going to whatever and getting a diamond. Yeah. And it looks nice. Yeah. Lapis, turquoise. Yeah. 
Wow. Okay. <laughs> Let's move on <laughs> before I <laughs> go down a dark path. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to bait you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> into, right. into a more interesting. Yeah. Everyone's uh, like, this show, it got so much better <laughs> as it went. You know, it's funny. Sometimes I'll have like these really deep, incredible conversations with our guests, only rarely with yeah. deep guests. But people are always like, hey, when you guys started talking about whatever, some stupid thing, that was the best part. I'm like, oh, well, I'm glad we're doing this then. It's a little human interest feature. A little a little bit. So uh, other chapters? Are there more? Did we do all eight? No, I'm trying to remember the other ones offhand. It's been a long time since I wrote that. I'm reading it again right now with our elders. Yeah. I have a group of um, aspiring elders I'm reading it with. Yeah. Uh, what do you wish your younger self knew about pastoring? I mean, not not even like before you got into nine marks and all that stuff. Just you've been pastoring for 20 some odd years, even with all the right theology in place. The Lord's probably worked some wisdom into you that even when you had the theological building blocks, you couldn't really see how to put them together the right way. So yeah. what's some good wisdom for your younger self? I think when I was younger, I was a lot more, I had so much more fear of man. Okay. What people thought of me, pleasing people. Um, and and so I would, I think I was driven a lot to perform and do a, do a good job because I wanted people to approve that I was doing a good job. And I think over the years, God has... And it's I say continuing to free me from that to be like, hey, listen, I just have to be faithful, and and be faithful to the Lord, and just trust that that the Word does the work, that the Spirit does the work, that I'm not the Holy Spirit, that I'm not I'm not the Messiah. You know, I love John. You know, when they come to him and like, are you the Christ? He's like, I am not. And uh, you know, so just embracing that. So so I think over the years I've just chilled out a lot in terms of all that 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 sort of approach to ministry and just kind of god makes you comfortable in your own skin yeah. you're like this is who i am and not as a way of settling for who you are in sin but just like accepting that you're limited that i need sleep i need to go on vacation i can only do so much i have these gifts i don't have those gifts that's okay to admit that yeah. and so i think just embracing weakness and limitation so that the Lord's power can be made perfect in our weakness. Amen, brother. What What is the greatest encouragement you see among pastors, I guess, in America, but in your network, wherever, right now, the greatest encouragement, and then one of the discouragements, a word of warning or exhortation that you might offer to yep. fellow pastors? I, I think when I look at the, the younger generation of pastors who are coming up, like they're, there's just a lot of them who... They, they just want the word. They want the real thing. They're not, they, they don't, they can like see through all the marketing yeah. and the glitz stuff. Yeah. And they're like, like they know they're being played to. Yeah. They're like, yeah, yeah. They're trying to make that music yeah. sound like whatever. And some people are like, oh, that's great. It's just yeah. like the radio. But there's a lot of these guys who are like, like, give me something real. Yeah. And they're right. drawn back to some of the the great writers of the past and some yeah. of the great traditions. So I, that, I find that just immensely encouraging. Because yeah. you know what? Those those younger and you know younger pastors twenties even the guys who are in their teens now are going to become pastors, mm -hmm. like they're not going to grow up in a culture that's going to be conducive to right. any kind of nominal faith. Yeah, like so they're going to have to be fighters. Yeah, they're going to have to be ready. Yeah, to stand with no cultural support. Yeah, and and I think that's that's who's coming up. Like they're like like we're soft, and I think the Lord's going to raise up like strong men. Amen. Brother. Who are just going to stand. Yeah. All right. Discouragement, frustration, something that you're concerned about. Um, I, I, I'm always concerned about uh, the evangelical church in America losing its nerve over the authority of God's word. Mm. And that's it's the root of so many things. Yeah. And I think all these things where we're capitulating to culture, yeah. because deep down, we really don't believe that this is the word of God almighty and we're not willing to take a stand on it. Hmm. So, amen, brother. Yep. All right, let's do some rapid fire questions, shall right. we? Okay. Uh, 9 11, was the government involved? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I can't, I can't talk on. about that because they might hear what I said. Right, no, that's true. Yeah. Tea or coffee? Coffee. Nice. Uh, which race is your least favorite? <laughs> uh, Ultra marathon. Nice. See, now you're understanding what we're doing I'm here. I'm saying it. Yeah. Uh, favorite TV show? 
uh, of all time? No, right of now? the last five months. Last five months. No, of course, of all time. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You're like between 89 and yeah. 91 February. <laughs> yes. Uh, right now, I'm I'm digging Shogun. Okay, uh, based off of the fantastic book. No, oh. you didn't know that. No. Okay. No. Uh, Dever, you listening? I'm, I'm with Lock you. in, dude. It's late. It's 9.04. Uh-huh. But you said Dever. I was like, oh. <laughs> You're like, what, daddy? Yeah. <laughs> I do <laughs> hope he, he will adopt me one day. <laughs> we got Ed on the show to sign adoption papers for me. Really? Without him realizing it. We had him sign a bunch of different papers. It was like, papers. hey, sign this stack. Yeah. And we're not going to tell you what it is. Just trust us. That's basically well, the first one. What did we say they were, with Luke? <laughs> uh, Signing. Yeah, I was like, really? this is an NDA. He was like, all right. Uh, I think that was it. No, they were like, there's like another one. It was like that's a liability like, waiver. Like, oh, it was liability. liability. Documented yeah. elder abuse. <laughs> yeah. Right? The, elder you've, abuse. you've filmed it. Right? And then the third one, we were like, oh, he didn't just sign this too. And he signed it. And we were like, well, you're my dad now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Dever, uh -huh. Piper, Keller, Sproul, Johnny Mac. We'll throw in Kevin DeYoung too. Uh -huh. Why not? You can only, you're on a desert island. You can only read uh, books from one of those authors for the rest of your life. Who do you pick? I'd, I'd pick Sproul. Yeah. Yeah. Why? Um, historical depth. Yeah. Clarity of systematic. Yeah. Theology. Uh, yeah. It's just, it's so rich. Yeah. Yeah. And you could take his sermons, yeah, which have been put into book form. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, it's tough. I pick any of those guys. Sure. They're all. They've all been. Well, let's uh, have blessed my soul. Round two. If you could only take one of their preaching with you on an island, let's say you have an iPod loaded up mm -hmm. with sermons, but you only get one. Mm -hmm. Dever Piper Keller Sproul Johnny Mac De Young. Um, probably De Young. Interesting. I really appreciate him. Yeah. He's a very good preacher. Very good preacher, very good. faithful expositor, mm -hmm. um, engaging. And I, I just have been so helped. Whenever he decides to weigh into a hot topic, yeah. I'm always like, and I have clarity. That is where he is the absolute best. He's the ironic. best. Yeah. You know, th I read their little, uh, their little, in the pews, their little, uh, yeah. what are they, like tithe cards or whatever? Right. Which drives me crazy. Come on, guys. Let's stop calling it. You probably call it tithe at your church, too. Um, yeah. Their their motto is... I try to avoid tithe. Good. Language. Their motto is stand on truth, walk in grace. Hmm. That That is kind of the tone he strikes whenever he gets into yeah, that's him. kerfuffles about things. Yeah, it's yeah, so helpful. Did we go to the moon? Um, You know, again, I don't know who's listening. Yeah. So I don't know if the government's listening. Yeah. So I can't comment. Okay. Yeah. Uh, if you had to pick a dictator to live yes, under, yes. Pol Pot, Xi Jinping, Stalin, <laughs> Mao, or Hitler. <laughs> we can never post this on YouTube. Why? <laughs> if I had to choose. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Ah, uh, boy. Uh, none. I, I don't. Really? I mean, when I was in Abu Dhabi, I lived under um, a monarch. Yeah. And it was great. I think I would have. Actually, it was wonderful. I think I would have chosen Hitler. Uh -huh. I'll tell you why. <laughs> 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 Room for nuance. <laughs> Listen, you gotta live Is this under. Nuance? <laughs> you gotta live under one of them, right? Do I? That's this is the thought experiment. Okay, that's okay. Thought you experiment. gotta live under one of them. I mean, for about five years with Hitler, you're just like riding high. You're like, we're doing this. Come on. We're crushing it. And then listen, the fall is so fast. You don't even know what happens. Uh -huh. And then afterwards, because after the Treaty of Versailles, World War One, oh, World War II happened because they treated Germany so harshly that they yeah. had to do that. Yeah. So now they're a little bit more lenient. So the repercussions <laughs> are lesser. <laughs> What, Anyways, that's my. Do, do you have a screenshot of like the the board with all the strings and the yarn? I uh, would love to see that. <laughs> I, I I do, and I'll send it to you. He's like, I've worked this out. Yes, but mine is uh is uh actually that'll lead me to my next question. Mine, I was gonna say mine is dispensationalism. Uh -huh. 
Uh, dispen, di- dispensationalism, all millennialism, preterism, partial preterism. Where you land? Um, I I would say I believe in inaugurated eschatology that okay. all the Old Testament prophecies have been have begun to be fulfilled in Christ uh-huh. and will reach their conclusion when He returns. Well, that's a non-answer. Yeah. Uh, favorite fiction? Uh, fantasy, of course. Okay. Yeah. Like Fifty Shades of Grey? Uh, not so much. Okay. What What are you What are you talking about? Uh, I'm. You know, anything like. You know, Lord of the Rings, dragons and warriors, and and quests. And have you done Red Rising? Uh, yeah, I read I read the first three books of Red Rising. You liked them? It was good. It was good. It was no, good. But not great though. Greg Gilbert. Was I, like, I, I, I didn't want to read the next three. Let's just say that I was like, I finished the first three, and I was like, okay, that's done. Okay. Pretty brutal. But if you had to choose C.S. Lewis, all of his corpus, or Tolkien, all of his corpus, you can only have one. What do you pick? Um. Corpus is Latin for body. <laughs> <laughs> Do tell. Uh, I would say, I mean, for the edification of my soul, C.S. Lewis, for my pleasure and enjoyment. You don't get to do that. You get to pick one. C.S. Lewis. Okay. Because uh, C.S. Lewis has all kinds of genres too. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know what the hottest letter in the alphabet is? <laughs> B. You know why? It turns oil to boil. Did I already tell you that? Uh-huh. Dang it, man. Yes. <laughs> Uh, mountains or beach? Uh, hmm. Probably beach. You live there, so I hope so. Yeah, I do love mountains. Favorite though. book outside of the Bible? Favorite book outside of the Bible? Oh. Um, like, favorite in what category? Like, mm-mm. 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 Th- no nuance? None. None. No room? There's no room. <laughs> 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 yeah. Uh, I love Arnold Dalimore's two volume biography of George Whitfield. Yeah. Like that like changed my life. Oh. Love that. Nice. Okay. Uh champagne or wine? Mm. I mean, champagne's not even really a thing. It's just Yeah. I don't know. What do you mean by that? It's just not there's no substance to it. Okay, so wine. Yeah. Okay. You drink. Mm. Mm. Android or iPhone? Oh, iPhone. Okay. Macaroni salad or potato salad? <laughs> <laughs> well, they're both so horrific. <laughs> really? Yeah. You can just choose egg salad if you want. Yeah, egg salad. Well, there you go. I'd go egg salad okay. over those two. All right. Night out or night in? Uh, night in. Yeah. Favorite movie? Um, Probably Return of the King. That's uh, Lord of the Rings? That's the third one. Yeah. Third Although... One. I just saw the second Dune, and it was redonkulous. Let's talk more about that. I feel like it was bloated. Really? I loved one, but we'll talk more about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Uh, one was tighter. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Concert or football game? Concert. Favorite band? I really like, I mean, influential on me as a kid, Petra. Oh, okay. Best to write sermons to, Daft Punk. What? <laughs> wow. Okay. Morning. You too. Huh? You too. Really? I love, um, and I love REM, even though they're so utterly not Christians. Yeah. But they just have incredible harmonies, melodies. Okay. And this, you know, that's why I grew up with. Morning person or night owl? Mm. I don't know, man. I got to work. So it's like, I feel like I've just been turned into a morning person. Yeah. Yeah. Burger King or McDonald's? Uh, You're just not a fast food guy? No. Okay. Uh, Mexican or Italian? Oh, Mexican for sure. For sure. For sure. For sure. (laughs) Uh, Barbecue or burger? Mm, Barbecue. Uh, French fry or onion ring? Mm, French fry. Chinese takeout Mm -hmm. and not the good kind. Okay. Like you're going to punish yourself. Yeah. Yeah. You might get sick. I'm going to pay. You're going to pay for this. Chinese takeout or sushi? Chinese take out. See, when I thought of this I love question, sushi, but I don't want to have bad sushi. Yeah. Because <laughs> Chinese takeout is bad. It's like, ooh, that was bad. Chinese other one, you're like, you're in the emergency room getting your stomach pumped. Yeah, I had a buddy who ate sushi from Kroger once, and I was like, hey, yeah, life's too short. Don't yeah. do that to yourself. Friends That's risky, brother. Friends. Uh, rock or rap? Uh, Obviously rock. rock, rock. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Classical or jazz? Classical. Trapped on an island with one systematic theology for the rest of your life. Which one do you choose? That's great. Um, Ligon Duncan said, 
Schlappy von Schmeier locker <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> um, ah, geez, that's a really tough one. I mean, I love Burkhoff. I love, um, um, I'm spacing on names. <laughs> he's like, works he's like what even is the systematic theology? Yeah. Um, yeah. Reform dogmatics. Okay. Yeah. yeah, by Bob Inc. There we go. He's so Space hot right now. Yeah. He's just so, his writing is almost like devotional. Mm. It's so good. Yeah. yeah. Did you read that in seminary or are you just reading it as of late? Bits. I haven't read it cover to cover. I would love to at some point. Now. <sighs> yeah. Okay. Wonderful Works of God is a good intro to a lot of these yeah. stuff. Yeah. If you had to do apologetics with one cult or just any false religion, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witness, uh, Islam, uh, Hinduism, which, what do you think would be the most interesting one for you to engage in? I think a really hard one is Hinduism. Yeah. If, like if I was going to have to go at one. Yeah. Because Hinduism, no matter, no matter what you say, they're like, cool. Yeah. You can yeah. park that right uh -huh. over here. Right. Yeah. Great. Add that over there. It's very hard. Yeah. Yeah. I think also like Shintoism, which yeah. uh, Buddhism and Shintoism are kind of from the same tree. I know that Shintoism is more Japan, yep. but Buddhism was very deeply rooted in in medieval Japan, yeah. uh, in feudal Japan. Uh, what's so difficult about that is that even when you go to use the language of God conceptually, that doesn't mean the same thing to them. So you have to like construct yes. an idea first. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, takes a lot of words. To come up with God. Yes. Versus like Islam, where you're like Allah and you're you're at least yeah. in the same neighborhood. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I'm not, I don't think, I don't think the God of Islam is the God of Correct. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Correct. But, yeah. you know, it, at least you're like monotheistic, all creator, all powerful. Yeah. yeah. What hymn do you want to be sung at your funeral? And can, I mean, uh, is it, it is well with my soul. Mm. When peace like a river. Because, well, f for... Which reason? That's my ahead. favorite song of all time. Can't How could it not be? How could it not that be? he will hold me fast. Yeah. But what you know is that when you sing that at your funeral, yeah, if there are Christians there, they're gonna crank it. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they're gonna let it rip. Yeah. yeah. Our church knows that like it doesn't matter if the guitarist has like or the piano player has like an aneurysm and falls on the ground. Like when he will hold me fast comes on, we're doing it. Yeah. 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 When peace like a river, I mean. Like almost like you can just send all the instrumentals out for a coffee break mm -hmm. and like, we're just going to rock this. I almost wonder if it wouldn't even be better. I mean, I guess a light piano accompaniment, but when a congregation is well-trained, yeah. when they believe in that song, especially if it's like a response song to, oh, yeah. a, to a, a strong uh, yeah. gospel sermon, just let the people do their thing. Yeah. You know? Yeah. They want to, they want to yell yeah. and let them. Right. What are you reading right now? Uh, in terms of what? Take that direction in. Take that question any direction you want to take. Um, for theology, actually, I'm just I just picked up uh, Matt Marker's new book in the Name Mark series on corporate worship. Very good. Super excited. Not about that new. That. Yeah, isn't no a new to me. Okay, so I just got a hold of that. Yeah. Um, and then uh, I've always wanted to read um, um the the book we just got free today. It's getting late on liberalism. What's his name? Machen. Christianity and liberalism. That's it. Come on, dude. Okay. So he I, has the best analogy in there for false. Yeah. I've been wanting religion. to read that. It's like yeah. one of those books. Where I'm like, oh, I can't wait to read that. And then I get like squirrel. But I mean, like, you've been, that's what, like for 50 years now? Yeah. Okay. But I have a lot of things like that in my life. <laughs> and then um, for pleasure reading, I'm reading through Terry Pratchett's Discworld series. Okay. Yeah. There's like 42 of them. That seems, sounds like a good place for us to end the <laughs> <laughs> end the interview, uh, brother. This has been great. It's been fun. It's been informative. I I bet our our viewers all there are dozens of us, dozens of us. Okay, I'm watching th this. watching this right now. So this will be good for them. Uh, no, seriously, this was good. I hope it'll be helpful for yeah pastors and for church members alike. If you're watching this or listening to this and you're like, oh, I don't think that's happening at my church. Yeah. We would encourage you to try to find a church where your soul can be shepherded. Mm -hmm. Look on the Nine Marks Church Search directory. Find somewhere where shepherds who love you and more importantly love God and his word will care for your soul mm -hmm. uh, like it's their job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's pray. Yeah. Lord, thank you so much for my brother. Thank you for the 
decades of experience that you've given him through many trials and tribulations, but also uh, through much uh, joy, deep joy, uh, the joy that can only be known in Christian service. We pray that you'll continue to bless him as he goes back uh, to the island to, to build that church back up there still in the aftermath of such a tragedy. We pray that you'll give him an abundance of the fruits of the Spirit uh, as your Spirit works powerfully in his life to lead your people. And Lord, we, we pray that this episode will, will do exactly what you want it to do, that it will uh, benefit the elect and that it will uh, glorify your name. We pray this in your name. Amen. <laughs>